Hey, welcome. Hey, Elgon. How are you, mate? Fine, you? Yeah, good. Just... How's everything in Norway? Yeah, good. Pretty good. Enjoying a long weekend. So, um, nah, it's, uh, it's been a nice weekend. The weather's getting better and, um, yeah, we're like... Mm. Are you getting... like on at the weekends or...? Yeah, I'm off on most weekends. Every now and then we do events and things that I'm working in. But, um, yeah, usually I'm free. So, start early tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah. actually, we, do. we locked on at the weekends. But we, we are free at the weeks and we are working. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah, right. So, how's everything in, uh, in Istanbul? Actually, it's not going good. No. Uh, yeah, government doesn't manage the situation actually. We're getting the seventh place about the infection in the world. Oh, is it so high? Yeah. yeah, wow. China is the sixth place, by the way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope things ease up a bit soon then, and um, you know, you can come over the, the hump. Uh, but, uh, I hope so. I hope yeah. so. Yeah, we, yeah. Uh, we recovered. We are wearing masks and some yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got to be careful. We're um, we're the same, and we're putting in lots of measures at work too to make sure that we um, are keeping separate from each other. So we always have people to back us up in case someone does get sick, and then the rest of the team will have to be quarantined. And so there's lots of small things we're doing too. But um, I think it feels like in Norway, at least, we're like things are starting to be opened again and restrictions are easing and um, yeah there'll probably come a second wave of infections <laughs> but it seems like they've been managed pretty well i so. think so yeah <laughs> hello everyone today our guest is ben Symes. he's a roster and trainer at mandelbo hi he put this and made Ross in my competition coffee since 2017 and yes. thanks to them uh, i have the success <laughs> ben always helped me for many topics related with coffee and we have many uh, questions for you Ben, uh, but Great. first, uh, can you introduce uh, yourself? Yeah. Yes, uh, hi Alcon and uh, thanks for having me on, this is my first time doing this uh, Instagram video so very exciting to do work with technology and um, also the yeah. first time we've chatted like face to face, yeah. like you said we've sent lots of emails yeah. And uh, we've been in touch for three years or so, like um, yeah, three years. Yeah, the last, and we've been roasting for you then, and uh, so it's really nice actually to yeah meet you in uh, not in person, but at least uh, see you and talk to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, like you said, I'm working in the team at the roastery with um, Marat and Potus and Tim. Um, that's the main roasting roasting team. My job is kind of like working in production. I also um, help with uh, wholesale customers doing training and courses and events, doing quality control with Tim. Tim is in charge of setting all the profiles and um, making sure the coffee is sort of tasting the way he wants it. And, but we work closely like that with the whole team. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's good fun. Um, you know, we're, we're, this is a pretty small roastery. We're not like a huge volumes and huge capacities, but we. Um, yeah, 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 you it's, have it's, right now Lorin Kestra. Yeah, ex exactly. So I think about um, two years ago, almost, or a year and a half, we, we moved uh, roastery locations. And at that time, we swapped from uh, an old UG15 um, Probat <laughs> to a Loring. Yeah, there's 35. So uh, we've been working on that for about a year and a half. So yeah, we've been learning kind of, I mean, we're always learning as we go. and. Uh, um, you often you're asking me lots of questions about roast profiles and things, and yeah. um, I'm showing you, and sort of we don't have any secrets, and like, but the whole time we're also sort of developing as well. So mm -hmm. it's um, yeah, it keeps it interesting like that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get it started in the coffee industry? When I moved to Norway, um, so I'm from Australia, and I, I met a Norwegian girl, and I came to Oslo about ten years ago, and. Um, I sort of worked a couple of odd jobs and on, on the side I was working at a cafe and that kind of struck a chord with me and I really enjoyed the um, like the teamwork, the camaraderie with the staff working in the service industry. So then I sort of got interested in coffee through that sort of cafe life and I 
yeah, I, I moved to another cafe which had a bit more kind of higher ambitions um, with their coffee program. And that's where I met people like Tim, um, Supreme Roastworks, uh, Sorberg Hansen, Kaffa. Like, they were probably like the four main roasteries back then. Um, and it was really, it was easy for me to sort of take the initiative and go and visit them, meet them and learn. And they were so open and uh, yeah, it was sort of from there I just sort of taught myself or learnt my way kind of into the being a barista and then into like a roastery and yeah and that's how we're sort of going from there it's nice yeah yeah it's not like a job that I, I sort of dreamed of as a child and it was it's, you sort of I think in the industry a lot of people sort of fall into like this business um, which makes it good in a way because you get a lot of different personalities a lot of different types of people and then you get to, um, yeah, people, obviously you have a passion for it and then um, you, there's room to grow and develop. And, yeah, um, so. also coffee scenes is very, uh, it's powerful, it's very big, huge and uh, it has uh, very potential and quality. Exactly, then, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, there's still so much to learn and, um, but like you say, it's a big world and there's a lot of, like inspirational people out there and, yeah. and coffees and farms and things like that so yeah so uh, i'm going to ask him the first question to you yeah great we got some questions yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, does the roasting process affect the caffeine content in coffee bean if it does how um so i don't think the roasting process is affecting the caffeine level in the coffee um I'm not, I haven't really researched this and we don't really do that. We don't really think too much about caffeine levels in the coffees that we roast. But um, the only thing I can think of there is that if you are roasting very dark, you're probably using, you probably need to use more, because then you're losing moisture and losing weight loss. So you're using more coffee to sort of brew the same amount of, um, of volume having a beverage. So I think if you're roasting dark, then by that way you're using more coffee and then you're probably using more, it's becoming more caffeinated as well. Mm -hmm. So I think dark roast, perhaps you get more caffeine. I'm not sure. Maybe you know better than me with that. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, but I don't think like the roasting itself is affecting the caffeine mm -hmm. level, yeah, in the bean. Next question is, how should be the roast profiling approach for espresso? How is yeah. the espresso roasting approach to Mandel Boss roasting? Yeah, okay, so um, that's a good question. Like, we, um, we, I suppose we're approaching espresso roasts like we approach all types of roasts in, that we do, that, um, whether it's filter or espresso. We roast the coffee and we, we really focus a lot on sensory analysis. So we cup, 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 and we do, um, we brew as espresso and we taste, and then we sort of work backwards from there and we look at profiles. Um, usually the coffees we roast for espresso, we also has a, we have as a filter on our menu. So we, we normally only have five or six coffees um, at one time released on the menu, and then one or two of those might be roasted in addition as espresso. Mm -hmm. So when we compare the espresso profile to the filter profile, we see that it's not that much difference. Um, usually we have a bit more heat in the beginning, like we, we probably um, start with a little bit more energy in the start and through the first half of the roast. And then we sort of come back to a similar like, levels as the profile. And we might go 5, 10, 15 seconds longer, depending on the coffee, um, one, two, three maximum three degrees higher in temperature mm -hmm. um, so they're not a great deal difference we really look at um, the roast degree a lot so we always measure the the, um, the darkness of the coffee so we um or the color we use a color track and we mm -hmm. take a measurement and we have a window so we, we're kind of looking for one or two points darker in the roast mm -hmm. degree um but yeah like the, Originally, the approach is kind of the same as when we're roasting any coffee. You know, we're looking for sort of um, clean, uh, transparent, um, sweet coffees. Definitely not sour shots of espresso. Definitely not bitter shots of espresso. Um, so, yeah, we, and we we sort of we're spending a lot of time with sensory analysis and cupping, cupping mm -hmm. like that, and then and then we're and then we're analyzing profiles from there. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question is very similar to uh, last question, uh, okay. but uh, this yeah. question also about to espresso brewing. Yeah. Uh, are there are there any big differences between espresso and filter coffee profile? Can yeah. we have a good espresso with filter roasted coffee? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I, I suppose I sort of talked about that in the last uh, answer as well. That. There's not huge differences between the profiles. Um, you know, I think people would be surprised at uh, how similar they are. Um, mm -hmm. But then our approach is quite light, and I think uh, our espressos are probably lighter than some people's filter roasts as well. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it might be like one or two degrees on the color um, color track reading, mm -hmm. and that's one of our sort of major indicators or quality control measures. Is I'm working with that and you know it might be five ten seconds longer uh, roasting or a couple of degrees higher um, depending on the coffee and the, the total duration of the roast as it is um, the second part I think yeah you can I don't think there's any problem brewing uh, espresso with filter coffees um, I think it's maybe a little bit more challenging to get the sweetness up um, and try to avoid that sort of like overly sour shots but you know, it's difficult at the best time to brew good espresso and you need to, if you have good sort of puff preparation. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no I'm problem. Back. I had a, uh, a also, uh, just dying. I, I, oh. uh, also uh, I always try the filter coffee profiles at the espresso brewing. Uh, I'm taking much longer shots than an espresso yeah. profile. You do that, yeah. Sometimes I try four to five seconds. Yeah, I would recommend. I think it's good maybe to up the ratio like, a bit as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, like if you can probably lower the TDS and, and still uh -huh, reach yeah. similar extraction percentages, maybe you get good results if you're using a lighter roasted coffee as well. Um, yeah. I'm going to next question. Yeah. What do you think roast and Ikawa roasters? Oh, yeah. When you consider the price performance panels? Yeah. Which one is more efficient and useful yeah. for roasting and roasting at home? Mm. Um, well, like to be honest, it's it's Tim's job really to do all the sample roasting, and um, so he's usually working with that. I occasionally mm. jump in and help him or do a few things as well. So I've used, I like to have used both of them. Um, both are good, but uh, now we're using the roast uh, roaster at the in the lab. And we have a Kawa there as well. I think the rest, uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure of the prices. I think rest is around 5,000 euros or something. I'm not sure what Kawa is costing these days. Um, so in terms of value, I'm not, I think the Kawa is a bit cheaper maybe, but um, we really love using the rest. Like it's, for me, it's very logical and it feels kind of natural when you're following it's very easy to kind of create profiles and follow curves and it, it feels similar to how i'm working on a lowering on a production roast so i can relate it a bit more i think um yeah you can you can probably it's a bit more efficient than the, the kawa too because you can roast while you're cooling the coffee in the cooling tray so um we sped, sped up the process a bit there um yeah, I mean, I'm happy with both. I really, for me, like, I wouldn't. Uh, one of the really great features with the Rust is they've got the first crack detection little microphone. Mm -hmm. So um, you can automatically mark first crack on there, like, in your profile while you're mm -hmm. sort of watching the feed. And then you can just sniff, like, um, from one roast to another, like, the same coffee is a little bit different. You can just sort of set your 50 second development time or whatever you like and um, it automatically logs first crack and yeah so yeah i mean both are quite automated and easy to work with like that but um, uh, is roast roasting with the hot air or uh, yeah hot air, hot air as well yeah electric roaster so um yeah they're very simple and easy to use um the car was maybe a bit more portable but the rest is too if you want to uh, yeah another question yeah. What are the effects of coffee bean density on roasting process? Mm. Uh, what should be the approach when profiling high density coffee beans? Um, oh, that's a good question. I suppose 
I haven't had that much experience with like low density beans in a way. I'm a bit spoiled as far as working with the qualities we work with that everything is pretty dense and um, mm -hmm. what I've read is you could need to be a bit more careful I think with low density coffees you need to probably have less heat. Um, I think high density beans you might know better than me too but high density beans can tolerate a bit more of a blasting in the beginning um, whereas yeah the heat transfer is a lot quicker in a lower density coffee. As you see that as you're roasting through the process, like as like um, you're losing moisture, like heat transfer is sort of going faster. So you sort of step back in stages with the gas. Um, so I think, yeah, you, they can probably tolerate a bit more heat with uh, the high density coffees um, than lower ones. Um, and then, yeah, like just be sort of careful um, at the end as you, as you always are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Okay. I'm going to the next question. Yeah. Uh, this question is from a roaster in New York who will be able okay. to watch the video because of the time differences. Yes. Uh, yeah. Good. The question is uh, your adherence to declining to rate of rice and if that's what you try to achieve on every roast. He okay. find on current yeah. new crop Ethiopian that it's difficult to keep it from crashing at the first crack. Uh, he would also like to know where thing to get in. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, starting with the first part of that question first is um, we don't really adhere to that philosophy. I mean, if you look at our roast curves, they are generally declining rate of rise throughout the roast, but you would probably have at least two or three of them you would say would be defined as like crashing and mm -hmm. um, and I think like Scott Rao will talk about as crashing and baking yeah, coffee. Yeah, that's what I always talk about too. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I've, I've read it, a, quite a lot about that. Glory, right? No, so um, yeah, I think he has also said that um, it's not applying so much for Loring Roasts. Um, <laughs> Loring Roasts are very, like they have very sensitive um, thermocouples. Um, they're very reactive with hot air. Um, and also we're we're sort of doing the Nordic roast style too. That's we're, we're kind of roasting probably lighter than a lot of people using these sort of methods as well. So we're maybe we're our roasts are shorter anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't really sort of follow that theory. Um, having said that, like I think the flexibility and like the maneuverability of lowering and it, you would be able to kind of control your rate of rise easily if you wanted to sort of have that sort of sloping constantly mm -hmm. sloping um, uh, downward ROR but I think you know um, you would just once you sort of got the hang of it you would be able to sort of adjust your your, your control down um, mm -hmm. what was the other part of the question it was like he's having trouble with the Ethiopian yeah uh, yeah, he is sure. classic brand roaster. I don't know the brand, but uh, he's struggling yeah. to eat coffee. Yeah, the crashing at the first crack. I yeah. think uh, that coffee maybe is getting stall. I don't know. Hard to know, and that, that's the thing. It's it's really difficult to sort of compare people's data and their their curves and um, especially rate of rise numbers too, because like. As we know, like everyone's thermocouples are different. Um, they're different thicknesses. They're in different positions. They're reading different things, and like they're they're completely different sensitivities. So, if you measure that exact same roast on our thermocouples, like you know, we might have much lower turning points and much higher finishing uh, roast temperatures. And so, you know, rate of rises will change too. So. Um, in general, like our philosophy is to um, sort of not over theorize too much, not plan and design roast curves before we are roasting. Um, I mean, obviously we have a plan with what we think we want to do at the start, but we don't have any set um, rate of rise numbers at certain points of the roast, or we don't have any like um, set um, durations for the different phases or we don't have um, any set numbers that it, it's, it's easy to fall into the trap of sort of um, being influenced by what you hear from other people designing these really sort of sexy curves and then <laughs> you know and then um, 
cupping and, and, and being a bit influenced by that in your cupping results as well. So mm -hmm. we sort of prefer to work backwards and um, cup, 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 work with sensory analysis mm -hmm. as a starting point. Um, and then go back and look at curves and see where we need to adjust and how that affects. And we make sort of little sort of baby steps and mighty uh, like minuscule changes because um, you know there's there's so much information there that you need to be able to sort of focus on a couple of things and actually see what you're changing and and the effect it's having as well. Um, yeah, so I was just like a bit weary of like uh, following one rule for any coffee. Like as I said, we've definitely got some profiles that are crashing, and and even if you know have a little flick at the end as well. And, uh, but they're cupping great, tasting good. So that works for us, and that works for our style. I mean, I'm sure we can improve. We're always trying to improve, and uh, um, I don't think we're ever satisfied with any of our our coffees either. So. Um, it's good to test, do a lot of testing. Yeah. One it's thing... All, yeah. At last, it's all it depends on all the things, actually. Yeah. yeah, exactly. For us, it's all about the cupping result, and um, we've got some pretty ugly-looking roast curves yeah. that are tasting great as well. Um, we, we look a lot at the roast degree, like I was <laughs> mentioning earlier, so we are very strict on the color track, and, and we have sort of a very tight window where we know the coffee will be tasting good and if it's lighter or darker it's under or over roasted for us so um for us that's a one of our major sort of qc um, defining points and then yeah we we sort of and we also we sort of look at the whole duration of the roast so we broke break it up into the phases of the roast but we sort of look at the total roast time a lot and think about does that need to be extended or shortened mm -hmm. and then that kind of uh, I suppose informs the rate of rise numbers too um, but you know we don't even mark first crack really like we just like uh, mark it at 200 as a mm -hmm. sort of a token no, point oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I think the first uh, first crack uh, became at lowering same degree. Yeah. Uh, 199 yeah. or 200. Yeah, I'm sure it is pretty consistent. Um, yeah. And you know, if you could hear it, you would it'd be easier to um, know exactly when it is for that particular variety of coffee. But we just pretend it's 200 for every coffee, and just so we have a marker on our curve, and then it's. Um, you know, we don't think about like, okay, that was a minute 20 development time. We, we think, okay, that was like a 10 minute roast or 10 minute 20. Mm -hmm. so. Also, I, I don't know, there is a thing uniformity about the first crack uh, because uh, some roasters uh, marking the first crack at the first crack, uh, some roasters uh, marking first exactly. crack yeah. when the loss of cracks. Uh, yeah, it so. actually depends. It's, uh, it could be a couple of seconds different exactly. and it's yeah I mean if you're doing that every time you're probably going to change like a little bit <laughs> here and there um, and the same for working in a team you know like when I have two other roasters working in production mm -hmm. um, yeah. there's going to be small changes so yeah um, those like we, we're trying to really simplify the process as much as we can like don't over complicate things um, so we, we yeah. never really over theorize or not over theorize but we, we don't have any um, you know huge sort of theory goals that we, we think we have to apply we, we just try to keep it really consistent and um, do the same thing every time and then we yeah we taste the coffees a lot Sustainability yeah, profiling is more important than a fancy curves, <laughs> actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. We use that uh, roasting philosophy, Scott Rose philosophy, at once. Yeah. That is only using the uh, philosophy at the Kenyan coffee, because mm. that Kenyan coffee, when it uh, became the first crack, mm. it's not crashed. I, uh, actually, it's getting uh, install. Uh, right. Degrees are getting minus. Yeah. And it's a very baked coffee when it's going like that. Yeah, and uh, when it's uh, Kenya became a first crack, we increased the gas and uh, we recovered yeah. the, the yeah. crashing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we use only uh, that Kenyan coffee. 
Yeah, actually. Yeah. Not only uh, every coffee. Uh, I'm going yeah, to exactly. make yeah. I mean, for me, it's like Cropster has been like the best thing that's ever happened. <laughs> like, I can't imagine roasting without um, Cropster or other data logging software. I heard Artisan is quite good as well. But, um, you know, having all that information is, is fantastic and being able to follow your curves and treat it. Yeah, we're always sort of tweaking and testing and uh, I'm sure we can improve a lot. I was actually looking at the, the Cabrera Geisha profiles we roasted for you and um, I noticed between this year and last year we've probably increased them by about 30 seconds total time in roast. So, um, you know, it, it's a massive change within 12 months on growing there. So, and also it's, we're quite new to this machine too. So. Um, constantly kind of work in progress yeah also it's very different than a probot i think yes exactly exactly so i think those series maybe work better with the drum roaster yeah. <laughs> i'm going to next question yeah uh, team mandelboss roasting team became champion many times in nordic roaster competition yes uh, can you tell us how is the nordic roaster competition what is nordic roaster competition and yeah. uh, which factor led you to first place many times yeah um yeah so for, uh, the nordic roaster competition is kind of like a part of the nordic roaster forum which happens every year um, it's been cancelled this year unfortunately um, due to the covid 19 but um generally it's a two-day forum where we get lots of um, interesting speakers together and we really sort of delve into roasting topics or subjects sort of relating to coffee roast. We need to roast two different coffees and then they're judged by the whole competition who is there or by the whole uh, audience and attendees who come. So um, there's two categories, um, usually one it will be like a defined category. Um, last year's theme I think was a uh, um rust resistant um mm. varieties uh, so yeah. you have two rounds one compulsory and one uh, open round yeah just like the yeah. cup but uh, at the compulsory round always has a team uh yes it does so it usually sort of fits the theme of that year's forum or the event mm -hmm. so um maybe we're focusing on one sort of thing i think um, last year we had copies from costa rica um, but yeah, like you say, every coffee, every roaster gets a very small amount of that coffee. So I think that we get 30 kilos and then you have to enter five or 10 kilos into the competition. So you don't get much time to do testing. Um, we normally do three batches, I think. Yeah. You might get 45 kilos and, um, yeah, you sort of have to, you've got like a, a small window to sort of work on that coffee and then you have to submit that one that's the best you can do and then um yeah like, then the other category is you get to choose the coffee but within a certain um framework and i think yeah last last year we had to choose hybrids that were um resistant to leaf rust so for us it's exciting like it's really good to be part of that competition because it's a chance for us to really focus on our process and we sort of approach it like we, we kind of don't try to change anything from our regular or the way we work with, you know, from day to day. We really focus on it. And I think we've had success mainly because of the green, like the green quality coffee. Uh, uh, you compete with uh, uh, Hope News coffee uh, from Honduras coffee, right? Last year? Yeah, yeah last year we did. Yeah, we used um, a Catimor from uh, uh -huh. Nascimento farm. Yeah, we're... We, we have used coffees from him a couple of times. We sort of think about like, what is the category? What will stand out on the cupping table? What will mm -hmm. other people bring? Um, what should we use? And then we normally have two or three options and then we'll roast them and we'll cup them and we'll decide what we like the best and then we'll sort of focus in on that. So that category, you get a bit more time to focus in on. You get a bit more volume to work with and you can sort of do some more testing. And then um, in the other category, it's a little more, um, yeah have sort of three sort of plans for how you want to roast it and then um, yeah go from there as well so it's uh, yeah. two years ago you compete with the sl28 what is the team of that year 
I think it was Colombian. Colombian washed or something like that, I think. So yeah, you, I mean, it's usually sometimes the categories are quite wide. I mean, but the reason to have categories is just so you can at least sort of narrow it down a little bit and not everyone will just kind of enter with their best ace in Geisha or you, know, you want to be able to level the playing field slightly. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think like I was saying, like the green coffee quality is probably the 90% of the reason why we've done so well. And then we've, we focus a lot on our roasting, you know, we as we do every week. Um, and we focus a lot on our quality control and our coffee. And that, because I think it's a good reflection of our roastery. I, we're not doing anything completely different than what we normally do. And also get to taste some great coffees from the other, like, I mean, the level is very high. And like, if you look at the scores, it's very close to numbers between yeah. one, two, three, four, and five. So it's been a bit of a surprise to, to win five in a row, but well, it's, it's, it, it's so close. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to the next question. Yeah. What is the vision behind your participation in competitions every year? The Nordic Roastery competition that is our main competition for us in the roastery. Um, mm -hmm. And I suppose the idea of it is like it's a chance to improve. Um, I think we can really focus on and it's a chance to sort of analyze and um, get better at what we're doing because we can always get better. We're never satisfied with how we're working or the end results that we copy. I think there's, mm -hmm. there's still definitely room for improvement. So that's a good chance for us to um, test things and see how they work as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think competition in general is, is, is great for that. Um, personally, like I'd like to try to compete in the um, cup tasting. Mm -hmm. championship in Norway. Um, I, like I was entered in this year, but we were so busy in production that I couldn't make it on a Wednesday. Um, uh, Brewers Cup is my favourite, like that you're competing in. Um, yeah. I think for me, like it's the most relatable. You know, I think it's um, it's it's not sort of overcomplicated. The coffee does the talking, and I can sort of think about when I brew coffee at home, and I can relate to that as well. Like the cup tasting as well is kind of less biased as well in, in its judging too because of course you know you've got to take into account um, someone else sort of judging and passing on you um, but uh, yeah like for us it, it, and for you um, it's an opportunity to really like analyze improve um, learn from what you're doing also, you know, uh, I competed this year at the Rossin Championship, but yeah. I messed up, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm yeah. getting this place. Uh, eight different competitors compete at this uh, championship this year. Yeah. At the single origin competition, I really messed up because uh, I don't calibrate myself to Classic Grand Monster. My single origin coffee doesn't crack. <laughs> it became at the 220 degrees, I think. I don't remember the exact number, but yeah, right. But it doesn't crack. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't know uh, why is that. Maybe it's about the thermocouples. I don't know. Yeah. But it doesn't crack and doesn't uh, get yeah. this. It's, yeah. It, it's like grass, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. I think. That's why we like the, ro the Nordic Roasting competition in a way because it sort of is um, a reflection of the way we work too. Like the the roasting competition, you know, it, it's all these small steps in a way. It's kind of like a Q grading competition because you you got to go through all these small steps like you do in a roastery. But um, that's not sort of like the way that we operate. Uh, so we haven't really entered that one recently. Although I think it's a good good opportunity to learn as well. But um, yeah, yeah. You, you're working but, on a different machine. Uh, and... Roasting championship, it's not so useful and learningful than a Nordic Roaster Championship. Nordic Roaster Championship is very useful and learningful competition, I think, because you compete with the team members and uh, yeah. you always uh, explain the roasting philosophy and profile. Yeah, uh, exactly. it's very good actually. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And. Um... Also, yeah, you, you get you get to meet the you know yeah, yeah, you meet the ten other people and you get to sort of really discuss and like the conversations you have kind of like in between the seminars and you know it's a really worthwhile shame it's been cancelled this year for the twenty twenty one. We're talking about the Nordic Roaster Forum yeah. compared to Roasting Championship. Did you compete before Roasting Championship? No, I haven't. 
It's sort of dominated over here by uh, Simo from Sulberg Hansen. And um, for me, he's one of the best roasters going around. So uh, I think it w that's interesting for us perhaps to do it one year. But um, like we were talking earlier, we've been focusing on the Nordic Roaster competition. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, that's sort of where we've been placing our energy. I think the competition for us is a good chance to improve and learn, but um, it's not kind of like the main sort of defining um, part of the roastery. Really. Yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of just something that we have to, to help us improve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not going to enter everything. In Rotten Championship, everything uh, gets faster. I think. Yeah. yeah. Because you have a limited time and you learn to collaborate yourself with the new roster mm. and this is not my uh, powerful thing no, it's, uh, it seems very difficult also yeah. i uh, i roast him at lorin yeah very different than a, another exactly. uh, classic drum roster unfortunately yeah for me this is very different than a lorin yeah yeah, it's hard to learn, but I will learn it <laughs> because we don't have we don't have any forum like Nordic Roaster Forum or Nordic yeah, Roaster yeah. Competition. Yeah. But uh, roasting competitions is really fun and good thing yeah. than a Brewers Cup or Barista Championship because uh, other ch championships is really stressful. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's really valuable and. Um... You just need to practice, you know, you need to get the practice in on those machines and like for me too, like I think if I tried to roast on a new machine for the first time, it would be a disaster because I think I'm a slow learner and I need to sort of do things in a very methodical order, um, step by step. So we, we follow a very strict routine at our roastery. We always, um, we have everything written down, we check it off as we go and um, everything is always the same. and that helps me and I think it helps the roastery sort of be consistent and try and, and kind of achieve good results. So I think when you throw in all these other sort of unknown elements, um, uh, yeah, I think you just need to practice on those things before you yeah. expect to get the tasty coffees. So, yeah. I'm going to next question. All right. Can you tell us about the usage and roasting differences between Probot UG15 and Loring Kestrat? Yes, all right. Um, yeah, we switched to a Lauren. I think for us at least it suits our style a little bit better maybe. Um, we're able to, like I feel like the roasts are more uniform, um, like more evenly developed, especially with the Caballero Geisha that we've been sending to you for um, mm -hmm. your competitions. I think the improvement has been massive in three years after switching I think the first ones we sent you were, were roasting on the program and then mm -hmm. the last two years have been online and I feel like we, we're just getting them more developed but yeah like especially I've noticed a big difference in the geisha like we were never 100% or we we're never very satisfied with the, the cupping results roasting it on the UG15 we felt like it was so hard to balance between being a bit too light and green and under roasted and then mm -hmm. Um, just going a little bit over and sort of being a little bit sort of dark and bitter. Um, but I, with the lowering, I feel like we have a wider sort of safe zone and um, the coffee's more evenly roasted through the bean. Um, so yeah, like first and foremost, I, I, I feel like we've really developed our profiles, especially on like espressos and um, some of these like kind of longer, weirder shaped coffees like the, the Geisha variety. Um, and otherwise, it's been it's modern technology. It's it, it's something that's made life a bit easier because it's more things are automated. Um, it's a little bit easier to clean. You know, um, we're using less gas. Like uh, so, like we have lower emissions. You know, with, like you're burning off all the smoke. So um, environmentally, it's friendlier. Um, there's a lot of little benefits, like which are, mm -hmm. have been kind of good for us as a roastery to work with. But um, yeah, I mean the best thing I think it's a really, I think the lowering suits our sort of style of roasting, and we, we can get more sort of evenly or uniform development. Um, also, like it's more consistent, like for us at least. Like we in Oslo, we have huge fluctuations in ambient temperature from seasons, and 
even from day to day, you know, like it can be like a plus of 10 different. So um, all the lowering it means we can, we can be more consistent around the cupping table and we notice like that um, we're not having as many kind of miss roasts or fails and mm -hmm. yeah, it's a little more logical. So. so we're happy with the change, but I mean, you, like that's sort of our experience and um, we were happy roasting on the UG15 too and like, yeah, like you said, Fulan now, they bought that from us and they're getting good results on that machine, but it's, um, yeah. Also, so, I see the differences. Uh, Last year Gesha between this year's Gesha. Mm, yeah. Uh, I used the uh, same parameters at the water and the uh, grinding. Yeah. Last year's Gesha's uh, are uh, last year's Gesha's TDS is 1.21 or 1.25. It's right. uh, really yeah. hard to extract. Uh, those mm. coffees. Yeah. But this year's cash is uh, more easy to extract. Yeah. Uh, when I use the same parameters or similar parameters, uh, this year's cash is TDS uh, 1.41 or 1.3. Yeah. Mm. Just like that, extraction that... is getting higher. It's uh, yeah. really uh, easy <laughs> to extract. This year's oh, that's good. I mean, that's what we want. I think that's what we uh, we want. Those sort of um, TDS numbers. We're aiming usually around 1.5 and 20, 20 plus um, extraction mm -hmm. cents. And yeah, like I was looking at the profiles that we sent to you last year and this year, and in that time, we've we've tweaked the roast a lot and we've extended the duration quite a lot. Um, I think we've gone a little bit darker too, maybe like half a point or something. But, um, main difference is like about 30 seconds longer roast duration and uh, yeah I feel like the coffees are tasting developed and sweet but you're not getting you know th there's kind of like a, a wider sort of safe zone but when we roasted on the probat I felt like it was a really small spot where you had to hit to get like that mm -hmm. that coffee nicely developed but not green or not roasty so yeah okay we have another question for yep. you right now from our audience. Yep. Uh, is it possible to roast consistently without measuring water activity levels? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we do. I think it's more important probably to take like the moisture content than water activity, like in terms of consistency and roasting. But um, Tim is always taking the water activity and uh, moisture content before we start, and then. Mm -hmm. um, you're following other routines like um, taking color, color, like roast degree readings. Like, um, all these small steps help maintain your consistency and you're cupping your coffee a lot too. And when you're cupping, having a reference coffee on the table too. So like you take someone from somewhere else, um, have something um, that is maybe a bit darker roasted than what you're doing or a bit lighter roasted than your style and keeping that as a reference so you can compare and then i think yeah you, you're able to maintain consistency if you if you put all these sort of qc measures in uh, place and mm -hmm. that's the best way i don't think i mean not one thing um works without the other really you need to make sure you've, you've mm -hmm. got like a whole system yeah uh, by the way simo uh Talk about you, Ben is the best. Uh, I saw he logged on. Hey, Simo. <laughs> He's a big inspiration for me and a big help. Elias says hi. Uh, yeah. You saw yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to next question. Yeah. Fantastic. What is the quenching and do you use quenching or not? No. Uh, so I think yeah, he's referring to um, quenching coffee in the cooling tray. And then just that is adding a bit of weight as well to the coffee. Mm -hmm. We're not using it at all. I've never used it. Um, I think it's more of a, I'm not even that familiar with the process, but I think it's it's used in more commercial settings. And um, for us, it's like cooling the coffee as fast as possible in the cooling tray, having a set time on that, and then uh, getting it out. That's kind of our process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you yeah. use uh, water quench for loading feature before? Uh, no, no. No. Okay. We use the quench feature like in the chaff drum and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, so we have that automatically set on the machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's sort of like automatically set up. And if, if we're doing a lot of batches in a day, we'll, uh -huh. we'll might push that a few more times just to quench the chaff a little extra. 
So that that is automated okay. on the machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the uh, last question. Yeah. Uh, what are the effects of coronavirus on coffee consumption habits in Norway? Yeah. Has there been any increase in the number of brewing coffee at home? Yes, definitely, definitely. I mean, everyone's at home, so they they need their coffee. So it's been a big change, and we have noticed a huge change in our business. It's like our web shop is probably three times as busy as it normally, maybe yeah. Yeah, three or four times as busy as it normally is. Um, so we're sending a lot of coffee home to people, um, which is great. That's one positive, I suppose, from this situation is. We, get more traffic through the webshop. Um, we've struggled a bit to adjust to that as well because there's a lot more correspondence and then there's been delays with posts and things like that. So we're, um, yeah, we're kind of like, it's, it's been a lot of work, but um, yeah, people here drink a lot of coffee at work and they drink a lot of coffee mm -hmm. in cafes and restaurants. Um, so our customers, you know, they're not open now, like offices are closed. And, the cafes we work with, some are closed, and restaurants are closed, so our volume has gone down, um, but it is coming back and we are sending a lot of coffee to people at home, so we're getting lots of questions on how to grind the coffee and how to brew it, uh, so that's it's nice that people really, they want to make a good cup of coffee in the morning, and, uh, you know, and they're doing it themselves instead of, you know, the big batch brewer at the office or the automated machine or something. Yeah, also we uh, we are busy like three times. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're a bit lucky in Norway. The restrictions are not as severe as some other places. Um, so, you know, cafe some cafes are still open. People are allowed to go out as long as they keep their social distance and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah it's it's different. It's a different time. So we're we're just adjusting the best we can. We're doing our best, trying to answer all the questions. Yeah. By the way, we're not uh, we're not open the cafes in Turkey. Whole in Europe are uh, getting to open cafes again. I think. Yeah, for us, like cafes are open if they also sell food, um, but only takeaway, um, um, one in one out of the shop sort of thing. So there've been some strict regulations, but they've been busy because everyone's home. Schools have been closed, um, kindergartens have been closed, so, um, you know, people are out in the neighbourhoods sort of walking around and um, mm -hmm. dropping in and buying a cup of coffee to take away and so, so, you know, so places are experiencing okay business, I think, in that sector, but um, it's really tough in other parts of the service industry, like you would imagine, like, um, the same for you guys with the restaurant scene and stuff, it's going to be hard. Um, but I think, yeah, things are coming back. And, for us, they're getting busier at the roastery too, so that's good. Yeah. But I think it's an opportunity for the specialty coffee roasters in mm. everywhere. Yeah. Because lots of uh, Starbucks customers or uh, yeah. other uh, brand customers came to specialty coffee roaster for uh, buying roasted yeah. coffee. Yeah. I think it's maybe it's opportunity for whole industry. I yeah, for sure. For sure, there's definitely some opportunities that arise out of this. We just need to sort of see how things work when life gets back to normal or how things come back in the end. Mm -hmm. and, um, like, I'm sure we're going to experience busier web shop going forward. I think people have kind of enjoyed the experience of um, getting coffee sent directly home, being able to, you know, get advice on brewing and experiments with different styles of brewing and things as well so we, we might lose some big wholesale customers we might lose some offices that buy 20 30 kilos a month or something you know maybe they don't have the economy in the beginning to come back and so we'll, we'll just see how we go there yeah. and so that's it yeah. uh, thank you for your participation thanks and thank also, you man uh, thank you for everything uh, <laughs> finally get a chance to uh, thank you face to face yeah and it's been a pleasure uh thanks for inviting me on it's been nice to talk to you and talk a bit about roasting and um yeah look forward to continuing working with you as well and like shame that you're not going to uh, melbourne but or you, you're going later in the year i suppose so yeah uh, postponed to november november yeah we'll see yes yeah, but i hope uh, not get postponed again yeah, it's hard to know. I hope you get a chance to uh, come to visit to Norway. 
Yeah, that would be fantastic. I'm yeah. uh, so want to uh, meet you yeah. face to face. Hold yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to come uh, up. I You're want to back to Twitter. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great to have you at the Royal Street. And um, yeah, uh, we'll keep working together. And yeah, yeah. thank you I'll so much fun. for.